I did my experiment on the effect of pH on bean growth, and actually I chose that because my dad is big into hydroponics. He has his own hydroponics grow station in our backyard, and so I wanted to see the different, um, the different parts that go into a hydroponic grow station, and the pH is a great, um, greatly important in it, and I wanted to try to optimize the growth of the different plants. I've always really liked science, but my chemistry teacher, Dr. Gaudioso, he really got me interested in the science projects and learning more and doing research on my own too, not just for school. Um, he showed me really that there's not just one outcome, there can be different outcomes and different reasons for doing science, but it all comes down to the way you do it and the love that you have for science. Last year I wasn't too big into it, but now it's my sophomore year in high school and I'm starting to think more about what I want to do when I grow up. Um, definitely something in computer sciences or chemistry, engineering. There are so many great projects here. It's amazing that so many people can come up with different experiments and all have different findings. So the day seven growth of the beans, that was actually the first I had seen of the growth. The beans hadn't grown in any of the pHs for quite some time until in the neutral pH, they sprouted on the fifth day. And so those were the first beans to start growing. And this is the neutral pH, so you can see that they're already higher than the others. Now on day 13, that was the last day I collected data, and the pH 3, which is more acidic, those plants had caught up, or almost caught up, to the pH 6. So they had grown much more than the pH of 9, which has little to almost no growth compared to the pH 6. Um, some of the effects that this might have on the real world is if you make sure that you have the right pH water in your hydroponics, then you can maximize the growth of your plants and maximize food production. So this could be a great way in the future for producing food with minimal land. Uh, my name is Marcel Sanchez. Um, I'm a 10th grader, a sophomore at Manatee High. Um, so here I am doing the effect of an acidic environment on various metals. I was trying to find the most beneficial way for architects to uh, deal with the environment, to find the most like resistible uh, metal to acid corrosion. Uh, here I was ranking the metals. So my hypothesis was if various metals are reacted, um, with hydrochloric acid, then the rank of activity can be determined, which it partially was because in some cases I haven't seen results as much for copper, nickel, iron, and lead. Uh, I started in eighth grade. I challenged myself by taking the uh, physical science uh, honors, which went pretty well. And then following that year, I was a freshman at Mitzi High. I did biology honors, did pretty well, high performance, excelled. And now I'm in chemistry honors, which very, this is probably one of my best subjects for science. I think I'll be interested in like probably either theoretical chem chemistry or organic. I'll say get involved because beforehand, like I had no clue what physical science was, but then I thought it was pretty interesting. So challenge yourself. Pretty beneficial, but in real case scenarios, it would be a good thing to know if the environment went up, the acidic environment, which this would take good cause. Um, he's very uh, outgoing, caring. He's one of those teachers that were always put in time to help the students, which those are kind of <laughs> rare nowadays to find. And he's just very, very uh, interesting. His personality is great. He's a good teacher.
I'm Chloe Thomas. I go to Manatee High School and I'm in 10th grade. I did an experiment on Wi-Fi and how it affects the germination of lima bean seeds. Well, there's been studies to show that Wi-Fi affects our disposition and I wanted to see if this translated to plants. In our growing age of technology, I wanted to see if all the Wi-Fi and internet sources could impact the environment. I found that it didn't affect the germination, but it affected the health of the seeds, so all the plants were significantly less healthy. This is the seeds placed afar from the router and these are the ones placed next to it. As you can see there's like discoloration and they're less healthy. It's just the radiation it affects how well they do. I think that it shows that all the Wi-Fi sources we have could be decreasing the availability of healthy plants in nature and affecting oxygen. I got interested in science a couple years ago when I had a really enthusiastic science teacher, Dr. Ventura. I would tell them that it's important to understand the world and what's going on around you and how everything affects your existence in it. My name is Joseph Borbeck. I am a sophomore at Manatee High. My experiment is finding the cure, which is determining the effectiveness of antibiotics against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. I came to choose this as my subject because I've been reading articles about different ways to fight antibiotics, different medical techniques, and new types of antibiotics that prove to be effective against all kinds of bacteria. My hypothesis was if I test three antibiotics against four bacteria that are both gram-positive and gram-negative, then it would prove that streptomycin would prove to be the most effective antibiotic against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. It came to be that ampicillin proved to be the most effective bacteria or antibiotic against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. I became interested in science when I went to the South Florida Museum. They have lots of different science programs that you can do at, as an elementary student, and I got really involved in that and with the museum itself. I would say it may come to surprise you, but science is involved in everything that you see and do around you, to the very phone you hold in your hand, to even the very school that you go to. Science is involved in all of that. I like it a lot. Chemistry is really interesting. It's not my favorite branch of science, but it is still very interesting to me to learn all the different kinds of elements and all their properties and what they can do. Yes, I wish to work in some field of the medical field. My name is Peter San. I am in the 10th grade. I go to Braden and Christian School. And my experiment was to test whether bleach or rubbing alcohol would have the be better effect of eliminating bacteria from a agar, I, agar plate on a petri dish. Why did I choose it? Well, bleach and rubbing alcohol are both uh, products that we use on a daily basis to clean our surfaces. My hypothesis was that bleach would do the better job in eliminating the bacteria and that rubbing alcohol would not be as effective. In the experiment, I used three petri dishes with agar, and one was the control, one was the bleach, and one was the rubbing alcohol. To obtain the bacteria, I used a sterile swab and obtained bacteria from the base of a kitchen sink, and then I used that swab to rub it on the agar plate in a zigzag formation across the entire plate. And one of them was the control, and the other two were bleach and rubbing alcohol. Now, I used a sterile, to, a sterile swab to obtain the bleach and the rubbing alcohol, two different swabs, and apply one of them onto one contaminated plate in, its sa in the same zigzag form, but to only half the plate, and the same with the rubbing alcohol. In my findings, I, re I found that bleach did not perform as well as I thought it would, and that it had more bacteria on the plate than the control itself, and the rubbing alcohol did the best job. Well, I've always been interested in science. It's always been a great topic of mine. And this year I am in biology. So this is a topic that would definitely concern many of the students and what we're studying. So I've been in science for a couple of years. I would say, you know, bacteria is a very important subject. And 
there's good bacteria and bad bacteria. It's found in your stomach. It's found all over the place. You can pick it up on a daily basis on accident. And whether you need to eliminate it or not is a very important subject. And this should not just be, you know, a warning for kids. I think it would be a very important subject for kids to get into and study. My name is Sabrina Abbott. I go to Manatee High School. I am in 10th grade and my experiment is, does the density of a ball define how high it will bounce? I think I came up with that idea because I wanted to do something that had to do with balls because I play softball. So I thought maybe if whenever a ground ball is hit to me, if the bounce defines how the density is. My hypothesis was if the density defines how high a ball will bounce, then the ball with the highest density will bounce the highest. My findings were that the density did not affect it whatsoever. Actually, the ball with the highest density did bounce the highest, but the ball with the lowest density bounced the second highest. I used five different balls. I used a ping pong ball, a baseball, a softball, a tennis ball, and a golf ball. And what I did was I took the ball and I used a caliper to get the radius and the diameter of it and then whenever I did that I also measured each ball on a scale and whenever I did that I got the volume I plugged into the volume formula and then whenever I got the volume I rolled the ball off a 78 centimeter table and I had a two meter tall board in centimeters and whenever I rolled it off I had a camera and I had it in, I had it in slow motion and whenever I had it in slow motion I would see where the ball bounced at its highest peak and that's how I would figure out what the height is and then I used all 10 trials I used and got the average height. I've been involved in science since I was in sixth grade. I've always been in honors or in advanced science because I like it. Uh, my name is Colton Lewis and I go to Bradenton Christian School. I'm a sophomore and uh, basically this is my project, uh, Cooling the Charge. And basically it was talking about um, how temperature affects conductive materials. And um, throughout my project I basically used two different conductive materials, uh, the elements of copper and aluminum at four different temperatures, uh, be it from a hot temperature, uh, 50 degrees Celsius, to a very cold temperature, uh, negative 125 degrees Celsius. And uh, just throughout the project, I just wanted to know how uh, the temperature affects the resistance of the materials I used. And um, going through the project um, and getting my results, it was a fun experience. And um, as I, my hypothesis that I um, thought would happen was, uh, was proven correct because the lower the temperature, uh, the less resistance is. Um, this would be connected to a carbon po uh, load tester, which is down here, you cannot see. And these two um, 30.48 centimeter rods, or about 12 inches, uh, encased in a PVC um, tube. Basically what I would do is this would be hooked up to, um, as I said, my load tester, along with a 12 volt car battery. And um, I would basically surge current through here and I would basically measure the resistance between point A here and point B and figure out the difference and the amount of current that was lost in between. I used my original two materials that I started off with. Obviously there was others that I considered um, such as other conductive materials that are just a little bit harder to come by. I chose these two because of their relative availability and cost effectiveness, uh, copper and aluminum. And uh, those are the two I started with and ended with. Uh, I used dry ice along with liquid nitrogen as two of my, my two uh, extremely cold coolants. Uh, the dry ice um, was a little bit harder to work with because it's obviously a solid. It's harder to um, manipulate. manipulate around my, uh, my rod to get it 
to cool. So that was a little bit of fun overcoming that challenge. But the liquid nitrogen, uh, the biggest issue I had with that, obviously it did cool the rod at quick rates, but the biggest issue was not only that it was, uh, it boiled off at a relatively quick pace, but the other thing was PVC is not rated for that type of cold. And so during that, um, there was barely enough time that it did not crack. I've been involved in science uh, since I was a little kid, I mean, so obviously through school and other things like that. And in terms of science fair, uh, I started it in sixth grade uh, and is gone. I'm a sophomore now, I'm a 10th grader, and I've just kind of gone from there. Uh, yes, sir, I plan to be in the, the U.S. Armed Forces, preferably uh, Air Force or Navy, in either aerospace or other uh, military engineering fields, be it actual uh, combat personnel or actually R&D. I would tell th these young minds that uh, if you have an interest in science, even if you don't, you need to just pursue it to have, I mean, if you have a dream in it, uh, expand upon it, go into it, dive deeper, learn more, and um, even if you don't like science, I mean, science is an integral part of our society, our life, and so I would just tell you that dream or not, just uh, experience science, I guess you would say, learn about it, and um, if you do have a passion in it, just follow that passion. My name is Ben Barnes. I'm in ninth grade. I go to Manatee High School. And basically, I wanted to see how different types of drinks would affect teeth. So I used bones as a model. In my first trial, I used chicken bones. In my second trial, I used cow bones. And the drinks that I used was uh, drinking water, Coke, lemonade, mug root beer, and Sprite for trial one. And for trial two, I used just regular bottled water, Coke, and lemonade. Well, um, I just know that a lot of people care for their teeth, they care about the color, care about, not really like size, but I don't want it to be like all spaced in and like missing teeth and all that stuff. So um, I just wanted to see how different drinks like erode your teeth and change the color. And I have some pictures down here, as you can see. That is water, it's a cow bone, and there's not really any difference. It's kind of kept its like kind of off-white, beige-ish color. And then when you get soaking into Coke, it gets like a really strong, like brown, like definite color. Hmm. And then this one is in lemonade. And I guess that's the drink that really like yellows out your teeth. Because hmm. you can see there's a definite difference from just drinking regular water to lemonade. I was surprised that lemonade was um, the most harmful because I've heard so many bad things about like Coke and Pepsi and Sprite just having like the phosphoric acid just like doing terrible things to your teeth but in lemonade I guess citric acid is really what like affects your teeth the most okay so it was the same process process for um, both bones so I would soak them in each drink for 24 hours the first time and I would dry them in an incubator you can kind of see in that picture um, for 24 hours and then I would, for um, just like a larger difference. I would soak him for a final 72 hours and then dry for another 24. Uh, yeah, I've seen a few projects, not too many. Uh, I think they all have pretty creative ideas, just a lot of thinking. Absolutely. My name is Danny Firstman. I'm a professor of political science at the State College of Florida, and I am judging the behavioral and social sciences group for the high school students and the middle school students. 
I think it's really just being able to see the the passion and the energy that the students bring. You know, they're nervous when they're talking to you, but you can see they've really put a lot of time into preparing these things. Um, they have answers that are far more polished than some of the stuff that I'm coming up with at this point in my life. And I'm like, this is really, you have prepared this presentation six or seven times, you're delivering it flawlessly. And even the students who don't, you know, you still get to have that connection with them. You get to, you get them to be able to feel a little bit more comfortable with their public speaking. And you just, it's really nice to see that, that inspiring new generation of talent that's coming up. Well, yeah, I think it speaks really highly for the students who put in the amount of time it takes to be able to perform these experiments, to design them, to write them up. You know, I think about what I was doing when I was their age. It involved a, a lot of Nintendo, a lot of Sega Genesis, um, not so much the time spent on the science fair projects. So I think it's really commendable. Anyone who's going to say, you know, the world is full of all these really great distractions that I'd love to be doing, but I'm going to set them aside and spend some time on what is really the application of schoolwork. Um, which is something that you know we all struggle with in our lives, with whether it be you know what, what we're going to do in our free time when we're at work, and you know some some email comes in, you want to go spend 20 minutes playing around with something, and they say no, we're not going to do that. We're just spending our time working on these science fair projects. I think that's really great. Well, there's a few things that, that you see over and over again in science fair projects that really indicate to you someone who's doing something great. Um, the first is something novel, something new, uh, maybe a, a research design that you hadn't thought of. Um, I, I've seen a couple projects where students come up with stuff and the first thing after hearing it, you're like, wow, like why hasn't some, you know, a scientist at UF done this? That's actually like a really great idea. Why has no one thought of this before? Um, and then part of that is just fluency of delivery. So when you come into it as a judge, you know, you have some general expertise in the area, but you don't know what their specific project is about. Can they explain it to you in a way that makes it clear, that makes it coherent, that you're able to ask informed questions about? So it's the combination of putting in the time to come up with something that's really cool and then being able to explain what you did in a way that, that makes sense. Absolutely. So, you know, we hear it all the time that, that the future of jobs is STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. And the truth is that no matter what you're doing in this world, whether it's, you know, a job in, in the service sector, whether it's a job in the hard sciences, whether it's a job that you don't necessarily even see the connection, science isn't just about the ability to know things about physics or about plants or about animals. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of, of interacting with the world and observing data and then processing it and thinking, okay, have I really figured out what I'm trying to look for? What is it that I'm interested in? How do I decide whether what I've come up with is, is correct or not? And so that general approach is, is applicable regardless of what field you're working in, is really the kind of critical thinking skills that the world is looking for these days. Probably the most important thing is for the students. The students have so many opportunities that they can get from competing in science fair. We've had students that have gone to college and actually done research and published their freshman year. We've had students that have actually gotten accepted to some colleges because of their science projects. There are cash awards and scholarships at state and at international science fair. And just the experience of science research. They um, are learning how to apply those scientific method that they use in classroom into real life problems. Well, I, I'm really pleased and this is why we require in my classes and I work with them. We start the very first week talking about it and I work with them with the statistics and, um, and experimental design to try to help them have a good project. I mainly work with ninth graders and, and so, and then we also have it for our chemistry honor students at our school. And it's, it's up to though the schools whether they want to participate, but students who are not in a school that's participating can still contact us, um, the co-directors, Dr. Larry Gaudioso and myself, Patricia Zalo, and we can help them still participate in the fair. It's always good to recognize students for achievements and all too often we hear bad things about students and these are students who are succeeding. We also hear more about sports than academics. And so we, want, um, we certainly want parents, teachers, administrators to come to the award ceremony and of course the students and their parents to come and be, um, allow the students to be recognized. Every student who competed will be recognized on stage and will have their name read and they'll go across stage. And we have um, 
the two, tri the two trips to state science fair and to international science fair. We have some special awards that will be given, so it's not just the place awards. If they want to be in science, if they want to go to college and be in any science-related um, field, they really should be doing science research because that's where most colleges are at now. They are having their undergraduate and graduate students doing research and presenting. And so this is just a first trial for them to see what it's like. And of course, research is huge now. There's so many things that haven't, uh, we never even think about, you know, five years ago and that are being invented now. So it's just, it is a doorway to their future. Well, this is, this is our future. These are the kids in middle school and high school that are just some of the best of the best and, and doing real science. And uh, this is what we need to nurture. And as a member of the community, a member of the math and science community, we want to give back. So I'm just more than happy to be here. Um, been doing it you know, lots of years, but uh, love folks like Pat Zalo who just keep the, keep the zeal, keep it moving and just so connected. Well, um, I helped out today in the microbiology section, and uh, what's really interesting to me is the f fascinating by what some of the questions that the students are trying to answer, both in terms of what is the, the best cleaning solution, what's the best solution to kind of prevent um, help with antibiotics, which is the most effective in uh, curing diseases. It's just fascinating what these kids come up with. It's wonderful. Well, a lot of it comes down fundamentally to what is the question and um, how well thought out has the question been. And then it comes down to methodology. Have they taken the necessary steps to figure out what the, what the hypothesis is and, and what the best way and method have they researched to find out how can I figure out if this is really true or not? And have they done that and done it well? Well, we certainly do. Our science department is second to none, and we, our students come and take the science that they need to go on in chemistry, biology, physics, professional school. Uh, students come to us and then go pretty much all over the country. Georgia Tech, University of Florida, Florida State, you name it, students have gone there, have done well, had very successful careers in science and technology. Hi, my name is Anna Zimmerman. I go to Braden River High School. I'm a junior, and let me tell you about my experiment. Uh, basically, I was encoding and decoding DNA sequences so that they can be later used for archiving. And this would work by having a test, or having a message, and then decoding it into a sequence. And then that sequence can be made into DNA and then stored. And DNA can be stored for basically millions of years. And that's much longer than CDs and DVDs, which last like 10 years maybe at most. So this would be like the optimum um, storage method, especially for archiving. Um, for this experiment, I created a uh, software that um, would encode and decode the DNA. This is basically what the program looked like. Um, I don't know if you can see it as far, but I'll get some close -ups. Okay. Yeah. Um, it has you input a message and then you can encode and then you'll see the DNA sequence and you can do the same thing if you have a DNA sequence. You can decode it and get a, a test or you can get the test message. It'll say test right there. Um, I also added error correction to um, my sequences so that if the DNA ever like an error occurred then it could be fixed and so I was testing four different types of error correction and their efficiencies so to test this I um, ran some Monte Carlo simulations which is basically uh, 10,000 tests per 0.1 percent increments of from 0 to 10 percent and these are the results of the um, Monte Carlo simulations uh, as you can see, this blue line right here represents the best version of error correction, which is the redundant error correction. And then after it, 
is the base two error correction that was also was actually a modified version that I discovered on my own. Really? And the original base two that I modified it from actually did very poorly. It's this blue line right here that was very close to no error correction at all, which is the red line right here. Yeah, actually, I thought the base two um, error correction would do a lot better than this because it's, um, it's base two hamming. It's used in computers, but this version is uh, seven four, and in computers they use 256 nine. And I mean, it's used in computers, it's used every day, so I thought it would be one of the most effective, but it turns out it wasn't. And um, actually I tested um, the efficiencies of all of the types of error corrections and it turns out the modified hamming that I discovered was actually the most efficient. So in the future, I think that'd be a good um, type of error correction to use in uh, when encoding and decoding DNA sequences. Well, um, this experiment, the applications for it would be uh, for archival storage and um, also in the future, if the technology is developed for it, uh, hard drives could be created on computers. They would be so much lighter. Um, basically, anything could be created. Like uh, 50 years ago, computers were huge. And so I think in another 50 years or so, the technology will be developed for us to uh, use DNA as storage for basically anything. I've always be, been interested in science. Um, ever since I've been little, I would always ask questions. and. Um, my parents used to watch uh, science channel things and um, I would always ask like, oh, how does this work? And I, I always remember being interested in it. And um, I've actually been doing science fair for the past three years and I, I love it. <laughs> to, uh, this year I'm taking chemistry, but last year I took AP biology and that's college level biology. and. That was one of the most interesting classes I've ever taken and my teacher inspired me. We'd have like the most interesting conversations and we'd always debate about different things in class and I really liked it. Uh, science is fun, like you learn so many interesting things.